Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. So welcome everyone to the Australian Water School's 100th webinar. My name is Karen Rouse and I'm CEO of Water Research Australia, who are the custodians of the Water School. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of our expert presenters to mark this incredible milestone for the AWS. And I have to say, not only is it wonderful to have something to celebrate in 2020, which has been such a difficult year for all of us, faced with the COVID-19 pandemic and accelerating impacts of climate change, but it's particularly exciting because of the difference that the AWS is making by helping us all to rise to these global challenges. So since its inception, the AWS has delivered demand-driven and industry design professional development and training to upskill and share knowledge across global water industry professionals. The AWS professional development offerings expanded to webinars in June 2016 and provided a learning and discussion forum for over 25,000 participants from 168 countries. Participants have come from across widely varying roles, including science, engineering, technical, planning, policy, environment, agriculture, mining, asset management and manufacturing. And if there's anyone here today that comes from something different to that, well, let us know because we'll add it to the list. The AWS YouTube channel has achieved over 160,000 views meaning our webinars are making an impact long after the day they take place. And despite reaching our 100th webinar, we've no plans to slow down. The AWS will continue to go from strength to strength, delivering high caliber online training, focusing on significant innovative or critical advances in water science, technology and management. While we broaden our portfolio in 2021, working with new organizations to bring you the best in training and education, We'll continue to provide online training through webinars, live and on-demand courses on the surface water and groundwater modeling packages, which include HECRAS, ModFlow, QGIS, HECHMS and TwoFlow. Next year, we'll see more training on climate adaptation, Australian rainfall and runoff, and the ever popular Python scripting. And for those of you who've just joined us, my name is Karen Rouse. I'm CEO of Water Research Australia, who are the custodians of the AWS. And today we're celebrating the incredible milestone of 100 webinars. Now I'd like to hand you over to Craig Price from Surface Water Solutions, who will chair today's webinar on using hydraulic modeling results for rock sizing. Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Karen. I'm thrilled to uh, have been invited to host this 100th webinar. We've had some great topics in the past and uh, look forward to these subjects that uh, Karen mentioned going forward. So today we have got a webinar called Rockin' It. Now, um, just a year ago, we had one called Roughing It, um, which appropriately enough on the cover of the Roughing It book here, we see some uh, early 20th century rip wrap bank revetments and uh, bridge abutments, scour protection, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So we are rocking it today. <clears throat> Here is the, uh, here's the subject matter. And to all of you attendees out there, all with different backgrounds, um, but all wanting to protect infrastructure and people by means of, in this case, rip wrap. And we'll talk about some other bank stabilization methods. Again, on to Casey's uh, bio here. Um, you can read this yourself, uh, but he comes without any introduction required because he's got a deep background in transportation projects and he's going to be presenting some of the industry standard up-to-date current methods for riprap sizing, what the pitfalls are, what you might need to be aware of when you're doing your rock sizing. Okay, and we're going to get into a lot of details today, and we don't have nearly enough time to cover all of the aspects of bank protection and riprap uh, stabilization. Uh, but what we're going to do as well is um, I'll share with you here a screen where you can see we've got a website set up here, surfacewater.biz slash riprap, where the resources that we discussed today um, are posted and available for you to share. Now, this is about you. Keep your feedback coming on the Q&A line during uh, the session. We'll try and get to as many of those questions as we can. We want to get your feedback. We want to address the questions that you have. And with that, let's have also a look at the poll results that you have filled out. And uh, that gives us a little bit of a background on who's attending today. And um, I'll have Casey introduce himself. And Casey, do you have any thoughts on uh, what you see here in the poll results? 
So over to you. No, this is great. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Casey Kramer from the United States in Olympia, Washington. So up in the Pacific Northwest, appreciate everyone filling out these poll results. Looks like we got a big group coming from consulting law. As always. That's always, as always. <laughs> we got HECRAS users, TwoFlow users, um, a nice diversity, not so much with Telemac. And this is great information. Really appreciate for you guys to uh, continue to fill out these polls. Looks like we get a variety of folks utilizing a variety of projects, coastal applications being the less culvert design looks like it's coming in the strongest and scour protection. So we have a, a nice distribution of old fashioned reinforced concrete um, all the way to bioengineering techniques and large materials. So yeah, no, this is great. Um, this, this information is really useful for us to, to talk about to, in today's presentation, but also for us to develop future coursework that would see your guys' needs. So greatly appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Casey. So what we're going to do here, um, I'm going to share my screen for a minute. We'll get, uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of an intro and and then we'll, we'll turn it over to, to Casey for the beef of the presentation today. All right. So what we're going to do here, I'll step through a few uh, intro slides before we turn over to Casey and just really introduce the subject here of using hydraulic modeling results for rock sizing. First of all, why do we want to do this? And here's a picture of uh, one of the reasons why you might want to protect your bridge abutments. Um, you know, you can see here from the Brisbane River. Um, uh, this, I think this thing broke loose in the end. Um, you know, can you protect these with riprap? Should you be using something else? And if you are going to protect it with riprap, can you use your hydraulic modeling results from a 1D model, a 2D model, a 3D model? What should you be doing? Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, let me just annotate my screen here so you can see my mouse. Um, you know, can you go in and look at hydraulic modeling results and extract them and try and uh, decide what, uh, what you're going to use? Um, can you size your riprap based on uh, what you're going to extract out of this model? Um, or do you need uh, to consider some other functions uh, in, your, uh, uh, in, in your results? And what are the pitfalls? So uh, Casey will talk a bit about that today. Um, I did want to, be, because this is the Australian Water School, uh, cover a little bit about where the Australian Australian uh, guidelines come from, and most uh, most of the engineering projects you see in Australia um, that involve riprap uh, as bank stabilization or as culvert tow protection um, will fall back on Austroads 2013. And that's something that has in it um, a few tables that might look familiar to the Australian audience. So I wanted to trace back the ancestry of some of these tables um, and talk about uh, you know where we're where we're going to go from here and what uh, what we should be doing with these uh, numbers. Can you simply take a velocity, which you'll see right here? turn it uh, into a riprap size, which has a given gradation and a D50, and turn this into basically a chart and just size your riprap off of that. Well, okay, if so, where are you extracting your velocity? Are you grabbing this from a 1D model? Is it averaged across the bank, you know, across the whole channel? Um, are you localized and looking at what's happening right where your riprap is? So if you take this table right here, um, this, these are the values from uh, the Austro's manual. You can plot them out and they work out to be approximately 35 times the velocity squared. Now we'll get a bit technical here in a minute, but um, I do want to trace the ancestry here of the, where this all comes from. Austro's 2013. Um, traces back to uh, Main Roads WA document, which traces back to the earlier Austro's document, um, which cites CABS, a California uh, agency here that um, put together um, an equation that um, was included in the 1970s manual, but refers back to a 1960s manual. And uh, with ECOM, I think the, uh, the fellow who uh, drew that up and put together the nomographs uh, drew from a couple of earlier studies and from some flooding that had happened in California in the 1920s. And again, in the 1930s, which wiped out what they had done in the 1920s. And they decided with this uh, Joint Bank Protection Committee um, that they needed some better methods. So they came up with these equations. Um, at the same time, though, go back to the 1920s, we had some canal work going on. And then Shields, um, who gets cited all the time, uh, went over to Germany and had a fascinating story. I'll post uh, some of the links to his story uh, in the chat line here momentarily. And some of Shields' work uh, in using 
shear parameters and things like that to predict incipient motion uh, went on to become some of the manuals that, uh, that that got published later on by the Corps of Engineers. And these methods, though, as we got up to the shear-based methods versus the um, velocity-based methods, uh, eventually got superseded. Now, again, Ostrode's 2013 still refers back to these CABS equations, which have then since been superseded and uh, go into some Corps of Engineers uh, manuals, which Casey will talk about. And what we'll do then, even though we've traced this all the way back to some of these other studies, um, we want to see what's happened you know, since then. Um, and so Casey will talk a bit about what the current guidelines are and uh, you know what, what has happened since these manuals that superseded the CABS equations. Now, interestingly enough, um, you know, these, these are the equations uh, that came from CABS. Now, if anybody out there can help me trace this back, um, this comes out of nowhere in the CABS manual and Withicombe went and developed this. If you can help me out here and anybody uh, you know, from Caltrans or anywhere else who's, look, who's watching this, I wanna know where this equation came from. Um, here's the nomograph. This is what's been used. This is what serves the background for you know, probably billions of dollars worth of uh, infrastructure across Australia. And I don't know where it came from comes from. It just comes out of nowhere and is, isn't cited in that 1960s manual. So um, help me out with that if you uh, if you have any uh, any leads there. I want to I want to trace that back even farther. Just want to highlight a couple of items on some of these charts. If we're taking rock sizing uh, or velocities and going to size our rock off of that, um, what I've got here in red is showing taking straight from a velocity and coming across to a stone diameter. So if I take a four meter a second velocity, this is straight out of the Ostros manual, we've got one along the bed showing us I need 300 mil riprap. But if I take it back to the standard table, I come up here and I need 600 mil riprap. Now there's a lot of technical detail behind the limitations of what we're showing here, but I do wanna highlight this difference. 300 mils to 600 mils might not seem all that much, but if that's a diameter, remember the diameter gets cubed. And so you've got like a factor of, uh, if you double your diameter, you've got a factor of eight on your weight. Um, so it's a big difference whether you use facing class riprap or quarter ton riprap. When should you use these? When should you use these? So going back to Simons Lee and Associates, which is where I started my career, same thing. Let's take a four meter a second velocity. Ostros will tell you, use 600 mil riprap. Well, look what happens when you start introducing a bend. It's gonna tell you that if I have a four meter a second velocity and I've got a bend of 60 degrees, you can't quarry riprap big enough to, uh, to withstand those hydraulic forces. Now, um, I do want to point out a couple of things on some of the, uh, the, the Fish and Itch publication, which um, is something that is a shear based one. Um, we talked about using velocities to size riprap. But what happens if you take a critical shear stress here, which uh, comes in uh, a few different manuals um, over the years has appeared. Um, it's basically a linear relationship between your critical shear stress or the, the, the shear stress that's exhibited in your system here and your rock size. So I've plotted this out here using some old Shields diagrams. If I take one, uh, you know, one Newton, I guess, per square meter, uh, one Pascal and come across this way, I get one millimeter of rock size. So if I take a one millimeter of rock size per Pascal and plot that up against these numbers, I come very close uh, with, with these numbers here. So that's incipient motion though. So if I go in and try and compare uh, velocity criteria versus shear stress. Um, we've just published a paper in the International Mine Water Association uh, proceedings last month, and I'll post a link to that as well if you're interested. Um, and using these different methodologies, what riprap size do you come up with? And again, I've got vastly different D50s here. Think about doubling your D50. That's a factor of eight. So what should we be using? A lot of money being uh, on the line here if we're going to try and decide between uh, one method versus another in sizing the riprap because it's a lot harder to import, uh, you know, four ton rock or two ton rock than just facing class riprap. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the velocities here then um, and how this relates to, uh, you know, to the, to the depth and the flood hazard. If I've got um, a velocity, say, of one meter a second, this is a standard flood hazard curve here. Um, if I've got a velocity of one meter a second, you can get vastly different flood hazards. Some will move buildings off their foundations. Some are okay for uh, people and for vehicles. Um, let's have a look here at some of these situations here. If I had a, velo um, a velocity of one meter a second, like you've got right here, 
okay, the people might be okay, you know, the tractor might be okay in this case, the building might be okay. What if it's now four meters deep and moving at one meter a second? You know, are you gonna need to have something stronger? And imagine trying to protect these things with riprap, protect the building with riprap. Does your riprap need to be bigger here or does it need to be bigger here? And there's some counterintuitive things going on here um, that, that, we, that, that Casey will get into in some of these equations. Um, but I did wanna just highlight the differences if you use a purely velocity-based approach to size your riprap. And you've got, for example, here a channel where you've got four meters a second in this big channel versus four meters a second in the small channel. One of them is gonna tell you you've got a higher shear stress in the smaller channel, but the other one's gonna tell you you got a higher DV in the bigger channel. So the flood hazard is bigger in this one, but the riprap size that you might get from a shear based method is gonna be higher in this one. And this is what drove engineers a little bit crazy back in the day when they were doing canal studies because they showed that at the same velocity, the shallower canals were having bigger problems than the deeper canals. And so what can, what can you do with your results? How can we figure out how big to make this riprap? Can you go in and zoom in on your hydraulic modeling results and extract out some, some, uh, some of these velocities here? I can go in and take 35 times V squared and take my velocity results here and plot out this, the riprap size that's needed with an Ostrode's uh, type velocity-based sizing. I can go in and do the same thing and plot the shear stress in Pascal's. And that will tell me how many millimeters large each particle would need to be to resist incipient motion. But the numbers I get are vastly different. So there's some uh, you know, interesting uh, features going on with the hydraulics and you gotta watch out if you extract hydraulic results from right around a culvert, you may only be getting the bank uh, or the channel hydraulics and you're probably not actually even looking inside the culvert at what's jetting out right at that outlet. So don't size your riprap based on what the channel's doing here if you've got two or three times the velocities right in the, inside that culvert. So we all know what happens inside a water column. Um, vertically as well as horizontally, and how you've got the fastest velocities on the inside and slower ones on the outside. So should we be looking at this maximum velocity here to size our riprap? And if so, should we be sizing all of the riprap that way? Or should we allow the velocities to decrease as you get to the outside um, and then use smaller riprap at the top? You know, if you look at a velocity profile, should we be sizing it vertically? Should we look at a 3D model? that has the capability of using a different velocity down at the bottom than at the top. Um, these are some of the things we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss in a, in, a, in a few minutes time here with Casey, um, but we do need to watch out for this V squared over 2G, this energy head that's coming into this, this velocity head that's driving into the, uh, into the culvert. You know, is this in the channel? And as you look at what's coming out here, do you have energy out in here in the bank? Um, are you accounting for what's shooting directly out of the culvert? So lots of applications for this. And again, I'm throwing a bunch of these out here um, as uh, kind of technical slides. And what I've got, um, I'll, I'll post a link here um, that, that puts all these together for anybody who wants to geek out on this in any more detail. Um, but I did wanna just, again, highlight some of the counterintuitive bits here. Um, these, this is the line of uh, the zone of applicability for some of the Maynard equations that we'll be looking at today. I've put these in green here. But watch out, look at this right here. And I don't know who's ever gotten, uh, gotten into a channel that's 20 meters deep, but let's look at the five meter and the two meter and the one meter, which becomes the Ostrode sizing right here. Again, um, for those non-technical in the audience, um, what we're doing here is just taking velocities and turning it into rock size. So if I have a velocity of five meters per second, Look at what this is telling us, and let's 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 have a have, have, let's have a discussion about this when we're done with the presentation here. If I've got five meters a second as a velocity, that tells me um, in this case, if I'm five meters deep, I need 500 mil riprap. But if I'm one meter deep, I need 800 mil or, or 750 mil riprap. You know, that's two or three times the weight for the shallower flow. And if you keep going shallower and shallower, it's going to show you that you need bigger rock than your flow depth. Does that make sense? I've seen projects get installed out there with big riprap where you've got you know, a, a one meter riprap size, but your flow depths are only half a meter. That's your design flow. Are we over-designing? Can we save ourselves some money? And what should we do uh, if we're interpreting these? What methods can we fall back on to convince ourselves that um, we can drop the riprap size a little bit? 
you know, looking at some of those failures, you got to be careful. You might not, uh, you know, be, before you go telling somebody, oh, you don't need that size riprap, you can go a little bit smaller. Think about the implications of being wrong in that. What do we need to consider here? So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And uh, then hopefully if you can share yours. Thanks, Gray. So hello, everyone. Um, all around, oh, you know, morning, afternoon, night, whatever time it is we're at. Thank you and welcome. Thanks for taking the time to participate in this Australian Water School webinar. Also, thanks to everyone that Cray mentioned and the Australian Water School for giving this opportunity to, to present everyone today. So with that, for as far as the presentation, you know, here's a brief overview of what this portion of the webinar is going to be covering. You know, please note that this is not a comprehensive tutorial for how to size rock, just rather some key elements uh, that should be thought of if you need to uh, size rock for your stream or your river project. Also, thanks to everyone that provided some of those answers to those poll questions. Obviously, this presentation is only talking about rock, but there is other materials and techniques that are utilized um, that we could cover in future webinars, you know, such as bioengineering, engineered log jams, large wooden material, and other types of techniques and material that's being utilized in our, in our stream and water bodies. Um, but, you know, due to time constraints, you know, this webinar is currently just focused on rock. Again, if you'd like more information on other materials or additional sub, uh, subjects, you know, please feel free to contact me or the Australian Water School, and we can look at uh, developing some lessons that are uh, more specific to meet some of your needs. Um, so as with any engineering analysis, the type of project and the goals associated with the project, you know, should be predetermined. The type and the goals of the project, you know, may influence the hydraulic modeling. It may influence the survey extents, uh, the selection of the right required calculations like Craig was going over and we'll go over a little bit later. There's a large variety of equations available um, and so on. And some of the typical projects that we work on here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, include anything from bank stabilization or um, bank protection to road, bridge, railway protection, river restoration, uh, fish passage, dam removals, coastal applications. So there's a large variety of the types of projects that we work on and that you all worked on that you uh, had placed in those poll questions. And so what we'll go over later on is the importance of aligning the type of project um, with the types of equations and the modeling that you're gonna be utilizing. Um, so with that, you know, selection of the most appropriate um, hydraulic model, um, after identifying the type of project, you know, the selection of the most appropriate hydraulic model really requires um, a careful assessment of which flow characteristics you believe are gonna be the most important to the engineering problem being addressed. So some of the key questions in the model selection could be, uh, what are those key hydraulic processes that you're observing at your site? You know, for example, are the flow characteristics best estimated with a one-dimensional model, a 2D model, a 3D model? Um, similarly uh, to that, though, to keep in mind is uh, the equations that you will be utilizing for your design, you know, understanding how those were originally developed as well, where they de developed um, with a 1D assumption, 2D assumption, or 3D assumption. And so aligning those becomes very important. What are the model extents um, to properly determine the flow characteristics at the project site? So this is pretty important as well, you know, as we've learned through previous webinars and, you know, terrain and the spatial extents um, are very important, um, especially due to you wanting to make sure that the flow characteristics at the project site are not influenced by your boundary conditions in your hydraulic model. Um, another important question, um, especially related to 2D and 3D models, uh, is the terrain and the mess resolution, and which is uh, needed to adequately represent the hydraulic characteristics you know, necessary uh, for the engineering problem being addressed. You know, as an example for, um, you know, is your project involving the need for large scaled average uh, values, you know, such as a floodplain assessment, or do you need more localized uh, velocity values, such as for a bridge scour analysis? Each one would require probably a different setup, both of terrain, mesh, and even model selection. Also asking yourself what other inputs are necessary. Um, do you need hydraulic structure geometry, such as there, is there bridges, is there culverts that you need their geometry? Um, should you be taking notes on the features um, on site uh, that might affect your roughness coefficient estimation? Um, estimates of how you're going to determine your hydrology, um, calibration, verification data, so on. This all comes into play in really selecting your most appropriate hydraulic model. 
you know, here's a here's really a simplified example um, to illustrate the importance for accounting for site conditions when in this case sizing rock, um, but would be true for any kind of um, design uh, hydraulic design. Really knowing the limitations of the model results and again how they fit into a given rock sizing equation is extremely important to make sure that you're within the applicability for how those original formulas were developed. Um, and just as an example, in this case, this yellow that you're seeing here, um, this is the velocities that you would tend to see um, with a one-dimensional model. Um, so as you can imagine, the flow on the outside of the bend is probably likely gonna be underestimated with a one-dimensional model or even a two-dimensional model if you have insufficient uh, mesh resolution. You know, if as you, and then as you add, if you're dealing with a two-dimensional model, as you add additional mesh resolution, you may actually be able to achieve a better estimate of the local velocities, which then may inform you even more of characteristics to help size your rock on your bank or other uh, material types. Um, however, as been, has been mentioned previously, uh, both in previous webinars and earlier, there is a point when that resolution does not provide more meaningful results and it can result in unnecessary model runtimes. So really the takeaway there is it's really important to balance the level of accuracy you need um, to establish those hydraulic characteristics, aligning them with the equation that you're gonna be utilizing them, and then balancing that obviously with time. Um, this actually shows the project site at a lower flow than the previous slide with the actual rock revetment being constructed. Um, I will say um, on this particular project, um, this actually was designed and constructed prior to 2D models being really the standard practice. Um, with that said, I will say that having 2D models as available tools, um, or 3D models for that matter, um, there would have been, definitely been less assumptions needed to design and construct this project. So here's another example. So this example, um, this graphic here shows velocity results from a 2D model. The, the blue is indicating lower velocities, the red showing higher velocities. The flow is coming off the top of your page and going down towards the bottom of your page. Um, and these are the velocity vectors that you're seeing here as well. And overlaid um, on this two-dimensional graphic is a cross-section layout that may be a typical section, uh, typical layout that you'd utilize with a 1D model. So note, if this project, if one of the goals of the project was to develop bank protection, um, the nice thing is, is that the magnitudes and the spatial locations where a countermeasure may be needed are, are graphically shown by the 2D model results. And so you can come in here visually and identify locations where you may um, be able to, um, you know, see what you're, observe what you're seeing on site and compare that and seeing that it makes sense with your 2D model results. This would not, definitely would not be the case with a 1D model. Um, and the 1D model would then obviously require some additional assumptions. Um, similarly, if a 1D model or a 2D model with poor resolution was used, um, they un may underestimate the velocities needed for design of a scour countermeasure. And so this slide here, what it's showing is an example, cross section A and cross section B. Um, you can see that there's the minimum across those cross sections that would have been utilized with a 1D model layout, for example. Um, you can see the minimum velocities that the, the 2D model is predicting, the average velocity, which would be um, similar to what you would see with a 1D model result, and then maximum velocities. And I guess what's really important here, and you know, it's probably not too much of a surprise, um, but with the two-dimensional model um, at a good resolution, we're actually seeing that a 1D model could potentially underestimate the maximum velocities by a factor of three. Um, and so this just really points out the importance for understanding um, the benefits from doing a two-dimensional versus a one-dimensional, and then applying some of those assumptions as you transition into your rock sizing equation. You know, one thing that also should be noted, um, you know, with any, with a lot of hydraulic models, typically there's an assumption of a fixed bed. And so I do want to stress the importance of understanding that this is really just a, snap, a snapshot in time. Um, and with that, as, with that stated, um, I can't stress enough, you know, the importance to really assess a variety of hydraulic characteristics in addition to a geomorph assessment. You know, a site reconnaissance is always a great start. And don't underestimate the, um, the, the benefit of having conversations with maintenance personnel um, when assessing your results and ultimately making that final decision for your design.
I guess, you know, nowadays too, with the three dimensionals coming online and computational times, you know, a, a 3D model would even probably provide even more detail on the flow characteristics, especially, you know, flow around a bend. Um, and so I guess with that said, you know, just as a general rule of thumb, you know, careful consideration on the level of analysis um, should be definitely assessed on a project by project basis. And that level of analysis should definitely be commensurate with, you know, the identified, identified project goals um, and ultimately probably the allowable risk um, of your project. So terrain and mesh resolution, um, obviously terrain and mesh resolution when you're looking at two dimensional and three dimensional models are really critical um, to assuring mean, meaningful model results. Um, in this example here, um, what you're seeing is a various uh, mesh resolutions depicted with a coarser mesh on the left towards a finer mesh on the right. And you know, as discussed um, during the last webinar and earlier during this one, you know, at some level of refinement, you're really no longer going to, you may no longer uh, achieve differences in the results. However, you could increase model computational time. Um, so as I stated earlier, you know, for these reasons, it's just really important um, that that assessment of which aspects of the project site flow characteristics are most important to the problem, uh, engineering problem being addressed, um, should be carefully evaluated. Um, in addition, it's really important to think about the equations you will be utilizing uh, for the design and to see that they were developed for the resolution of the results um, needed to most accurately represent the flow characteristics at your project site. You know, I think what you'll see, and, and Cray touched on this, and for those, of the, for those that have used the existing equations or have tried to compute SCOUR, I think you will find that in some uh, cases, equations were, were developed for a one-dimensional average type of result. Um, thus, you know, understanding the limitations and the applicability of a given equation is just really important. So some rock sizing methods. Um, obviously, you know, Cray had a huge list there. Um, this is definitely not a comprehensive list, rather just some typical methods um, used for typical projects that may involve rock sizing. Um, obviously, like Cray mentioned, you know, rock sizing methods in, um, can cover a variety of different project goals. Some rock sizing methods um, include, you know, but are not limited to like the Maynard equation, which is provided in the Corps of Engineers Engineering Manual 1601 or also in uh, Federal Highways uh, HEC 23. Um, those are often used for bank protection or bank stabilization. Um, ISBOSH, or, which is also covered in the Federal Highways HEC 23, is typically used for uh, bridge, bridge pier and abutment protection. For river restoration, stream uh, restoration, fish passage, water crossing design, some of those um, like shear based method like uh, Cray was referring to with the modified shields um, may be utilized or conversely for steeper slopes, you may go with a critical discharge such as like as a Bathurst method um, for sizing your, your, your substrate. Um, or in Australia, as Cray mentioned, um, the Austro's 2013 manual. Um, for the, for the sizing of rock to be you know, utilized for a scour or an erosion scour countermeasure, you know, it's very important. I will say it's very important to understand um, you know, what the failure mechanisms are at your site. And again, also identifying that allowable risk to the asset. So for example, as an extreme, you know, are you designing a scour countermeasure for an interstate bridge or are you just trying to restore some natural stream processes for a fish passage project? Um, obviously these would, re, would likely result um, um, having a different set of goals and, and thus most likely require a different method. Um, so important again, just to identify that uh, the goals and the type of project and align that with the type of equation that you'll be utilizing. <clears throat> so after reviewing the various rock sizing methods, um, again, I can't be, you know, I, I'm stressing this a lot, that, that need uh, to align the project type with the most appropriate rock sizing equation. Um, you know, we definitely aren't covering everything during this webinar. You know, there is some critical steps, like I mentioned previously, such as, you know, conducting that site reconnaissance, you know, talking with some of your maintenance personnel who may have that on the ground experience of what's worked in the past and what hasn't. Um, in addition to the on the ground experience, you know, a geomorphic assessment, that identification of the allowable risks um, to a given asset or adjacent property um, and other factors um, may come into play 
um, ultimately to selecting the most appropriate rock sizing equation. So moving right along, similarly to that importance of the correct model selection, understanding that applicability and the limitations to a given equation is, is really essential. Um, some applicability and limitations for each equation could include uh, channel bed or energy grade slope, uh, relative submergence, in other words, the, the ratio of the flow depth to the larger size of the particles. Um, you know, are, your, are your particles protruding out of the flow or are they submerged? Um, sediment size, you know, your, your characteristic grain sizes that you'll see, uh, D16, your D50, your D84. Um, the uniformity of the material, is it well graded? Is it poorly graded? You know, typically taken as a ratio of the larger um, size class fraction to the lower class fraction. Um, the shape of the material, is it round? Is it angular? You know, all of these things come into play um, when a lot of these equations were being developed. And so it's important to align um, some of those uh, limitations uh, to the goals of your project and your site um, characteristics. And um, so actually, yeah, once the, once the rock is sized, um, it needs to be utilized to achieve the project goals. And so there's obviously a, a, a large variety of, of design types out there. As an example here, um, the top of the graphic is showing a rock, a typical rock revetment. Um, the, you know, this may include a filter, you know, either utilizing a geotextile or a granule filter, um, specifying a rock layer thickness, the spatial extents, you know, upstream and downstream, how far does it need to go? Um, your 2D or your 3D model may help you um, make judgment of that in addition to what you observe on site. Um, the elevation extents, um, how far does it need to go uh, below the bed to account for scour? Conversely, um, some other design components for more of a, on a stream restoration or fish passage design, you know, maybe what is that uh, rock layer thickness needed to account for the active layer or that embedment of the boulders um, that may be serving as uh, additional roughness elements or just overall bed stability in general. An often overlooked um, piece to all of this is really important. Um, and that's the importance of um, uh, specifying the right, the, the rock, <laughs> um, basically the materials that you need for your construction. Um, you know, material specifications um, should include at a minimum, the minimum allowable durability. Um, the minimum allowable durability could include, include anything from resistance to abrasion, from a resistance resistance to chemical weathering, um, resistance from degradation of freezing and thawing or wetting and drying, um, minimum allowable specific gravity, uh, the allowable ranges, uh, size ranges and gradations, um, allowable particle shapes. Also extremely important to this is even though you specify it in your contract, it's critical to get out there in the field during construction and do a careful inspection of the specified materials during construction. And that's really to assure that the materials that you specified are what the contractor is actually use, using. And you know, even, even more importantly, installing per plan. That's often an overlooked piece of the whole equation and is, is definitely very important. Um, they're going to, we'll provide a PDF of this presentation and in that there is all these hyperlinks um, to these, some of these references. Um, Federal Highways, HEC 15, um, the design of roadside channels with flexible linings. Um, HEC 23 is the bridge scour and stream instability countermeasure manual, actually, and this is currently being updated, so look out for a, an update to this manual. For those that haven't used it, the Federal Highways Hydraulic Toolbox is an excellent free tool uh, that contains many of the available methods in a free calculator. Anything from bridge um, scour analyses to rock sizing methods to uh, multiple different types of calculations that as a hydraulic designer would come in handy. Um, the Corps of Engineers um, hydraulic design of uh, flood control channels. The National Cooperative Higher Aid Research Program Report 568. This uh, covers some recommended specifications for riprap, um, uh, design criteria and quality control. Uh, the USDA Forest Service, um, they have a stream simulation aquatic organism passage at stream crossings manual. This goes into uh, pretty good detail on some of the um, you know, excess uh, shear shields or bather sizing methods um, for stream bed cobbles and boulders. 
Um, I also threw in here uh, the Washington State Department of Transportation, some standard specifications uh, for some different types of rock, anything from large rock for erosion and scour protection, all the way to some street bed uh, cobbles and boulders that may be utilized for, for habitat restoration projects. Also, for those that haven't downloaded it, um, the Federal Highway's 2D modeling um, uh, reference document is a great uh, reference document for how to set up a two-dimensional two model and then also extract values for different types of analyses, anything from determining freeboard at a bridge all the way to um, sizing a rock riprap. Um, and then also, as Cray mentioned, um, the Ostro's 2013 manual and a free link uh, to that manual is available there. So in conclusion, yeah, we, we covered a lot. Um, hopefully this has been helpful. Um, you know, we obviously covered some of those key points that should be thought of uh, if you do need to conduct a rock sizing analysis. Again, if you do um, or would like more information, uh, please feel free to contact me or the Australian Water School or anyone else I'm um, showing up here. And we can definitely investigate some uh, more lessons that are more specific to meet your needs. And with that, we definitely would uh, enjoy to hear some feedback, some questions, um, and we'll do our best to provide some answers. Great. Thanks, Casey. Um, again, this is uh, this is an overview. And what we want at the end of this is for you to tell us what do you want more of? You know, we can we can uh, structure an entire course around bridge scour. Um, I do want to highlight that if for those who use HECRAS, um, I've just heard from Stanford Gibson that they are building a riprap sizing calculator right into HECRAS. Um, might not be in this next version 6.0, but uh, in 6.1, um, there's some exciting things coming. Um, I will put links to all of these. Um, I've, I've got uh, on my website, surfacewater.biz slash riprap, all one word. Um, I'm putting some of these links in there. That's going to be a live site where I continue to post some of the items there. Right now, it's just a bullet list with six or eight different resources, but I'm going to continue building on that. So I'll post that link here in the, uh, in the chat line um, if you're interested in, um, in, in looking up any, any of these sources. Now, we want to hear from you. Um, about what you would want to see more of, but uh, we also want to hear from you right now. Um, we've got about 15 <laughs> minutes left. Um, we've been answering some of these questions online. Uh, a few of them, there's quite a few that still need to be answered. Casey, you may want to have a look at some of these and see which ones you might want to hit. One of the questions that came up that got upvoted quite a bit um, was about uh, culvert inlets and outlets. And mm. so I, I'll, um, let me just share real quick uh, on my screen, just again, something to watch out for. Um, if you're gonna be sizing culvert inlets and outlets um, for, for riprap, uh, watch out for the near field um, and, and what's going on right there. I've got um, a similar structure here. Um, hopefully you can see this. Um, if I zoom in and have a look at what's going on immediately around uh, a culvert inlet or a culvert outlet, um, if, if I look at this and then extract 1D culvert results, um, you know, the, the culvert tables, the flows uh, that, that I would be getting right, right here through uh, a culvert group, and I, and I look at these flows and I see how much flow is going through this pipe. What will happen is if you just look at the channel on the outside, even if you're zooming way into the culvert inlet and outlet, you are not going to see what's happening right there. Okay, any 2D model um, typically is going to build in 1D hydraulics or nomographs for the culverts themselves. So be very careful if you're going in and trying to extract results that are in the channel out here um, because your velocities right inside that culvert and right at the immediate area of the exit here can be three or four times what the velocities are just a few meters downstream. So be very careful if you're sizing localized riprap based off of something you've zoomed into and you think you're looking at the outlet, uh, you may not be. Always look at your 1D nomographs. Always look at just a simple thing like Q equals VA. You know, the, the, the discharge through this is gonna equal the velocity times its area. And you're not gonna increase, you're not gonna be able to go any, any further on the conveyance area than the culvert size itself. So that's gonna be your limitation. Um, and if you haven't designed for those velocities, uh, you may be in trouble when, when the flood comes through. So that's one question that came up. Casey, do you see any others that you wanted to hit um, off the bat? Otherwise we'll go with the most upvoted ones. Um, yeah, so do we just hit that answer live? 
Um, sure. Yeah, you can hit answer live and then okay. um, th then let's discuss it. Um, one thing to watch out for is that those watching the YouTube recording are not going to see these questions in a text form. So let's just be sure we repeat the question um, as, yeah. as we answer it. So any, any that you wanted to highlight here? Yeah, so Martin, um, his question, engineers will frequently increase rock size without increasing mannings in. Do your observations about larger rock and shallow channels take into account the increase in mannings in? for both the increased rock size and shallower flow. So I would say definitely that is something to look at. It's not uncommon um, to have a different roughness value uh, for a different given flow. Um, there is actually some research that's going on right now through the National Cooperative uh, Highway Research Program into um, identifying better uh, guidance for the selection of Manning's in or roughness coefficients for the various two-dimensional models. Um, it probably won't be published for a while, but I would highly encourage folks to keep their eyes open. I, um, I'm optimistic that I'll have some good information um, for the whole variety of different models and, and better having an understanding for that selection of Manning's um, or other roughness coefficients for the selection of two-dimensional models. Great. Um, and and um, I'll post one of the links that's on that surfacewater.biz slash riprap page um, points you to a toolbox that will just derive the Manning's roughness for the recommended rock size. Um, and sometimes you can, uh, yeah, the, the, you've, you've got to watch out. Again, if you've got boulders that are many times the size of your flow depth, um, think about what that does to your roughness coefficients. And it, it can be much, much higher um, than typical typical values when you get these roughness elements uh, or depth, roughness elements exceeding or re reaching some uh, significant uh, factor of the, uh, uh, of the flow depth. Yeah, and we can provide some additional references for that. There is some good equations out there that do look at that term relative submergence, that, that ratio of the flow depth to the particle size. Um, and then relate that back to a roughness coefficient. Um, so there is some equations out there that do help with that. Again, they were, they were most of them were developed for one dimensional models. Um, uh, so you do be careful with that. Yes. Um, I would refer you back to, um, on some of these questions about 2D versus 1D versus 3, 3D, um, refer you back to a document, I think um, Gary Bruner at HECRAS just put one together about uh, com comparing, uh, you know, when, when do you select one versus the other. Uh, watch the, some of the webinars that um, uh, WBM have done over the last, uh, just some excellent material about the, um, uh, the, the cell sizes um, that you might use um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've had some of those. Um, some of these questions, um, you know, have been covered in detail on some previous webinars. So I'll put links to those in the responses here. I did want to mention on the 3D question here, David Williams asked uh, about a 3D condition um, and, and getting hydraulic vertical rollers. Actually, I just talked about uh, talk, talked about this yesterday with some people who had uh, recommended looking at a, uh, a research paper about the Brisbane River floods in, in 2011 when um, there were some uh, bridge structures that uh, and, and some piers that had failed. Um, and the vertical rollers became very important um, as you went around a very sharp bend. Um, I'll post a link to that one as well. Um, any, uh, we did have a 3D webinar um, a, a, about a year ago um, talking about how, how it's becoming more and more commonplace to model localized near field hydraulics uh, in 3D. Your time may be limited. Maybe you only can do that for the um, instance of peak flow for a few minutes, but it does give you your hydraulics and won't be depth averaged as you'll see in the 1D and 2D models. Um, any, any further thoughts on uh, when to go 3D, uh, Casey, or um, any resources you might point people to if they do decide that 1D or 2D won't be adequate? Yeah, no, I think it really just depends on the site, right? And, and really making sure that you are selecting a model that's gonna most appropriately um, uh, mimic this, the the conditions you do on see on site. You know, I, secondary to that though, I see David was asking a question about like specific to the Maynard equation, um, and and it's used for traditionally utilizing average velocities. And there's that RC over W um, uh, term, radius of curvature divided by the width, which usually is amplifying your your average results. And I would say specifically for the Maynard equation. Um, definitely that ability to utilize your, your localized velocities um, near the toe. Um, I think, you know, specifically, I think it says 20% from the, the toe. Um, but utilizing those from a, a two-dimensional hydraulic model is a good standard practice with the caveat, though, that you do have good resolution. 
um, you know, the, with the various types of models out there, having that subgrid um, method, you know, make, you know, understanding that there is only one velocity per cell is important. Um, so that caveat using local velocities, but make sure your resolution actually is getting the localized velocities. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, great question. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think that happens a lot where watch out because you, your 2D model will show how it varies and how that you can have uh, that variation. But some of these models already account for that. They, they knew when they were only able to develop a, uh, you know, maybe up to three channels, maybe a leftover bank, a right over bank and a channel uh, velocity. Um, you know, they knew that that varies inside of there. And when they said use the average, they knew that, well, in reality, you're going to get something um, uh, much, much higher. And that's been accounted for. So if you then go use your localized max velocity in one of these equations, it's going to beef it up even more and it'll say, oh, well, if that's your average velocity, then your peak must be this. But if you're already using your peak, you know, you could be you could be over designing. Uh, there's one comment here about, uh, yeah, some revisions to, to Ostroads. And I know Ostroads does refer back um, and, and says that um, the individual states in Australia can uh, supersede that. Uh, most of them do continue to fall back on the uh, velocity based method. But I do see uh, in some of the Queensland manuals, um, some of the uh, other other materials um, or other other resources. When you look into those, though, a lot of them fall back on either a, a standard shear or a standard velocity method, and it's going to be some factor times the velocity squared, um, you know, the energy head basically. Um, but uh, but some of them do get get a little more complex than that. So th thanks for those uh, some of those comments about um, things that have been superseded from the 2013 uh, version. Anything else you see on there, um, Casey, that you wanted to um, hit for now? Looks like Frank Frank uh, Fernando has a question. Um, when we estimate average velocity across the channel, should we extract velocity bank to bank, including zero velocities, or is it better to get average across main waterway area? We'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, you know, I, I would say it's really dependent on what you are calculating. Um, as an example, if you're going to be utilizing a 2D model to assess contraction scour um, at a bridge crossing, um, you know, that equation it typically is best practice to utilize the width that's capable of transporting sediment. Um, and so in that case, you wouldn't use bank to bank. Um, you would look at, you know, excess velocities or excess uh, shear to determine the appropriate width that could be transport the sediment. Um, and then utilize those in your in your calculation. Um, so with the, in in that regard, um, I would not recommend going to the to the zero velocities. But again, it, it really would probably depend on what that calculation would be used for. Thanks, can you see? Um, uh, one question I wanted to ask here, sorry, I'm just posting uh, some of these more resources because I know some people have mentioned Catchments and Creeks, which is an awesome compilation of uh, uh, by, by a consultant who's just uh, just retired, um, uh, but has posted lots of technical information on the background to rock sizing equations. And so I've got a link to that as well. Um, Surfacewater.biz slash riprap um, will take you to all of those papers. Now, Casey, a question for you here. Um, let me share my screen. Um, um, and I was going to ask you this earlier and uh, didn't get around to it. If you can see my screen there, have a look at this um, in a uh, report about Shields' 1936 landmark study um, written in Nazi Germany from a guy who just yeah, really struggled to try to uh, get over there at his own cost. And then uh, yeah, read his story here if you can. Uh, but look, research by Kramer and Casey. Any relation? <laughs> Not that I know of, no. But you know, they were probably rocking it too. So uh. yes. <laughs> anyway, I saw that. Saw that. This on there. They came. That's Kramer, funny. Kramer and Casey's right there. Same spelling and everything. So um, that, that's one of the citations. So uh, that's yeah, great. Just th th thought I'd ask the question. Um, <laughs> any any others that you see out there? We just got uh, maybe about a minute or two left. Um, we'll try and hit some of the rest of these um, uh, individually. But any that you see that you wanted to hit before we log off? Let's see here. Oops, yes, yeah, somebody mentioned the um, hydraulic toolbox um, and the ability for it to actually uh, read and tell you a given grain size distribution. Um, so absolutely, you know, and also to that point, kind of mentioned in the presentation, you know, once you do get the rock sized, having that gradation is extremely important. And, and a matter of fact, having a, a well graded distribution of rock riprap, if that's what your project needs, um, is, is it can be far more important than having the right size. Um, so spot on right there. And, and for that, I, I, yeah, there is some more additional information on that in HEC 23, 
um, or that NCHRP uh, 568 report has a good write-up about that as well. Um, so yeah, excellent comments. Thanks. Um, now that, and those those resources again, keep keep sending these over, and um, I'm, I'm going to keep compiling these on that website uh, again, surfacewater.biz slash uh, slash riprap. Um, I think there's there's probably a few others that, um, uh, that that have come in that we probably won't have time to answer, um, but I think um, yeah, Casey, any any others that you want to hit real quick? Yeah, I see. I see a few of these. Then that um, you know, yeah, you know, we, we've got to be um, again. Always, always look at what you're going to be using this for. Um, there are different applications, and like like Casey mentioned, um, that gradation is going to be very important. Um, I see a couple of the questions about that. You know, you can size rock that's just going to sit there high and dry because you've got the rock and some contractor put it in um, because it said put this size rock in, and they just laid it on the ground, and you didn't need to move the rock with your energy you just need to move the substrate. And so you get all these like rock shoots that just sit there perched high and dry because the scouring forces just took out what was underneath it. And I've got an example in the sediment transport webinar we did about a year ago where I showed a 10,000 ton piece of a dam abutment that was floated downstream by hydraulic forces where the equations will tell you there's no possible way this can be mobilized. Well, it didn't have to mobilize it. It just had to roll downhill after mm -hmm. the material underneath it was mobilized. So, you know, do be careful. It, you, you have to have this interlocking, well-graded mix um, that allows the larger material to lock the smaller material in place. Otherwise, the flow is just going to go down below and wash out your foundation material. Absolutely. So with, yeah, with, with that, um, let's see, let's do a little bit of housekeeping then. We're looking forward to further interactions with you. Thanks so much for your feedback. Casey, any closing remarks before we... Close no, off. yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for your time. Thanks for that opportunity. Hope yeah. everyone has a safe re remainder of 2020. <laughs> Sounds good. So here are uh, uh, on your screen, you'll see a list of courses coming up. Um, we're going to be hitting uh, right off the bat. Uh, we don't get political here, but um, we will be hitting climate change uh, right off the bat in, in uh, February 2021 um, with some uh, extreme event size uh, uh, hydraulics and, and hydrology and how, how climate change might affect that. Um, other courses coming up, um, we've got webinars on uh, rain on grid modeling, um, 2D versus 3D for sediment transport, which is awesome new developments. And very soon we're open to have the launch of uh, the new HECRAS version and we'll get that going soon. So thanks so much for your participation, Casey. Thanks for coming on board. Do stay in touch. It's a, it's a small world in what we do, but a large uh, spread of where we're all at online training and online interactions. Um, even though we'd prefer to be face to face, this is what we've got now for, uh, for the meantime. So let's make the most of it. Stay in touch. Um, let's do some good in the world. Let's protect things that need protecting and uh, use the best sound engineering principles to do so. And let's exchange that information amongst our, uh, ourselves and in the industry to help further the science and keep people safe. Thanks for that. We'll sign off. Bye. Take care. Bye now. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.